Welcome back to the channel. Today we're continuing our drapery study on the female form. I had a little setback. Sometimes things don't go as planned with water clay. When I came in this morning, I found the sculpture it had toppled over its base. That's one of the challenges of working without an armature. But it's all part of the process. And within a few hours, I was right back on track. And here, you can see me working on the gesture. The model is seated on a block, with her left thigh raised as she reaches for her foot. It's a beautiful, dynamic pose. And the model is beautiful. When I begin a sculpture, I start working thin to thick. I avoid adding too much bulk early on, which gives me the flexibility to make adjustment as needed throughout the process. In the beginning, I create what I consider to be an armature. It's crucial to think of things simply at this stage. When I was younger, I would rush into details, eager to sculpt the hair, the breasts, the knees, and all the superficial elements. But over time, I've learned that it's far more effective to commit to building a strong foundation. It's important to take your time and ensure you have a solid start before moving on to the finer details. In the past, when I taught art classes, both drawing and sculpture, I noticed that beginner students often work too quickly, eager to finish. But reaching the end fast wasn't always a good thing. What would happen is that the proportions or the structure would be off, and by the time they'd added so much detail, they'd be reluctant to make necessary corrections. In art, much like any discipline, preparation is key. It reminds me of a quote often attributed to Abraham Lincoln, of all people. He said, Give me six hours to chop down a tree, and I will spend the first four sharpening the axe. The same principle applies with sculpting or drawing. Taking time to build a solid foundation rather than rushing into details allows for a better results in that long run. Just as sharpening the axe makes the job easier, a well-planned foundation makes the artwork stronger and often more refined. In this part, I'm adding bulk to the neck and various parts of the body. Although the model itself doesn't have a thick neck, sometimes I need to add more mass like the arms and the neck to provide extra support while the clay firms up. Water clay has a unique quality. It feels alive, changing from day to day depending on its consistency. It's very versatile and you can carve it, you can sculpt it, and it has all the properties other clays have, yet it remains quite affordable. At this stage, I'm not focusing on adding muscles, but rather slowly building up the sculpture to get the gesture and pose right. As I mentioned earlier, I avoid rushing through this process. My goal is to establish the overall form before adding details. This aluminum foil tool is actually a potter's tool. It's important to find the tools that work best for you. Some artists prefer using their hands, while others opt for wooden or even silicone tools. Personally, once I find a tool that I really like, I tend to use it more than anything else. As I've progressed in sculpture, I've come to appreciate the texture and marks left on the clay. Early on, when I rushed towards details and realism, I would avoid any trace of tool marks, but now, I find that I actually like them. They add a human element to the sculpture. On the other hand, 3D printing offers a smooth, flawless finish, which is great if you prefer that polished look. Personally though, I steer away from that in my sculptures. I want my work to feel handmade, with the uniqueness that comes from the artist's touch. Water clay is perfect for this. It's so responsive that it can even capture the subtlety of fingerprints. When comparing water clay to oil clay, 
I still find water clay to be far superior. While I appreciate the qualities of oil clay for certain applications, water clay offers a distinct look that I find more compelling. There's something incredibly natural about working with clay that comes from the earth. And it's reassuring to know that this material will last for thousands of years. Back to the sculpture. Here I am trimming down a little bit of the platform. It's crucial not to make the base or platform where the model sits too large. Even if it's proportionate to your reference, I prefer to keep it smaller. My focus is on the highlighting of the model, not the base. You can use the base and platform for reference to establish proportions in the beginning. And it's important to remember that the base itself isn't the focus. Art isn't just about realism. When discussing the Renaissance with art enthusiasts, they often praise their realism. However, I always disagree. Michelangelo's David, for example, it's not about realism. The greatness lies in the idealized form and crafted by one of the greatest artists to ever live. It's this idealism rather than mere realism that makes the sculpture truly to the sculpture. You can see me using what are some refer to as an armature, wooden sticks. I use these in sections where I need to bond parts together, like the arm to the leg. The arm on its own isn't strong enough to support the structure, it's too thin and, I, and would dry out too quickly. It's a good idea to add more bulk to the arm to prevent it from drying too fast. I'm currently joining the arm to the leg with the right arm reaching for that left foot. This pose is quite delicate and the subtle poses are often more challenging than dynamic or extreme ones. I'm hopeful that I can make this work. The left arm is resting on that left thigh and even though the model is fully draped in fabric, I chose to sculpt her as if she were nude. While I don't add details to the figure at this stage, it's crucial to get the underlying form right. You can't effectively add drapery if the foundation isn't solid. It all comes back to the importance of a strong foundation from the very beginning. Between her thighs, the figure will be draped, but I won't add details in the inner thighs, like the sartorius muscle for example. Instead, I've added more bulk in that area to ensure the sculpture remains strong. In water clay, it's important to hollow out the interior, because the clay shrinks as the water evaporates. The base and torso will eventually be hollow. I'll demonstrate this process in a future video. I'll scoop out the inside and vent the space to the bottom. Different clays shrink at varying rates, and the clay I'm using contains grog, which helps minimize shrinkage. What is grog? Grog is a material used in pottery and sculpture that consists of crushed pre-fired clay. It's added to the clay body to improve its properties. It reduces shrinkage, it improves the strength, enhances sculpture and improves workability. I prefer clay without grog for sculpting, but if you're gonna fire your sculptures, you can thank me later. A lot of these sculptures, if they, you do not use grog, are much harder to fire and they'll create cracks and sometimes even break inside the kiln when you fire it. And no, you cannot take this clay and bake it in a regular oven. You have to use a kiln for that. If you don't have a kiln, the best thing you can do is reach out to a potter near you or a place that does ceramics and have them fire it for you. One downside of water clay, of course, is the firing process, as many people don't have access to a kiln. I have, I've even heard of individuals digging a hole in their backyard to fire their pottery and sculptures. However, that challenge is hard because you cannot control the temperature and it can be quite difficult. 
proper firing is crucial for achieving the desired results and ensuring the piece is durable. Back to the sculpture, I'm adding bulk to the torso and upper body. This step is crucial for two reasons. First, it provides added strength to the sculpture so it doesn't collapse or droop as it dries. And second, it creates a solid base for adding the muscles and finer details later on. Here, I'm adding hair to the sculpture. While I previously mentioned the importance of a strong foundation and avoiding details early on, there's a practical reason for this. Adding hair on a female model with a thin neck, it's not just decoration, it acts as an armature. It helps to reinforce and support a very thin neck. I'm always amazed how heavy the head can be with water clay. Without proper support, you need to build additional clay structures or rigs to prevent them from toppling off to the back of the neck. I'm adding some sections to help me remember where key features are, like the clavicles. When focusing on details, you need to prioritize the bone structure. Understanding and establishing the bones is more crucial than focusing on muscles at the beginning and it's often in an aspect that gets overlooked. In art, it's not just what you see that matters. This is why studying bones and muscles is so crucial in sculpture. Serious sculptors focus on these underlying structures rather than just the skin. Sculpting involves more in-depth study of the human form compared to painting. They have to learn the origin and insertion of muscles, details that painters might not delve into. I hope you enjoyed watching this process. If you did, it would really help me out if you could subscribe to the channel and like the video. Stay tuned for the next update where I'll continue working on the sculpture. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.